want to start by acknowledging with gratitude that I stand here on the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Amid all the fun, exciting, and emotional talks you're going to hear today, I get to tell you about voting systems. <laughs> how they work, how they sometimes don't work, the perennial Canadian problem of electoral dysfunction. There someday will be a drug. Uh, in the meantime, <laughs> we have it in our hands to fix our broken voting system, but first we need to understand it. So one of the things I want to share with you is that it's really easy to vote using almost any voting system you can think of. But people who use that voting system often find it hard to explain the system they're used to. I discovered this when I was on the Special Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform. And forum research came to us to tell us that they had polled Canadians to find out if we even knew the name of the system we're using. Now, they made it easy. They actually created a multiple choice list and went out to find out, could Canadians pick from a list? You know, you've got the line, you've got preferential voting, proportional representation, or first past the post. I was actually quite surprised to find that most Canadians couldn't properly name the system we're using from a multiple choice question. Only 40% could. And 40% saw that it was first past the post also probably couldn't explain how it worked exactly. Because any voting system can be complicated to explain even if it's easy to use. For instance, I hear news media people all the time during an election talking about the campaign to elect a new prime minister. News flash to news media, we don't elect prime ministers in Canada. We do not hold an election to choose a new prime minister. The only voters in Canada who ever saw Justin Trudeau's name on a ballot in 2015 were the voters in Papineau, in his riding, in Quebec. We elect members of parliament in a Westminster parliamentary system, and I want to shed a bit of light on that. But I want to give us three easy how-to things you think about when you design a voting system. Okay, and I'll walk, them, I'll walk you through them, but here they are, three things. One, design a voting system for people, not horses. <laughs> it's more important than you think, this one. Two, avoid the problem of having the wrong winner. And three, <laughs> well. I think you already are ahead of me on this, but three, <laughs> come up with a voting system that's designed for voters, not for political parties. So let me start with the first one. What about horses? Why do we have so much horsey stuff in our voting system? We talk about the ridings. We have ridings across Canada, and each riding elects an MP. And then we have the electoral system we use, first past the post. Well, riding is about how much of a district in the olden days you could ride around on horseback, I guess, to either collect the votes or go back to tell your constituents what you've been doing. And first past the post is a term from horse racing. Horse racing term. So all of these, these strange things that were going on were involving horses. Now, first past the post is actually a rule that was the, the first horse that got its nose over the line would win all the money, even if that horse was later disqualified. I found this from a book published in 1880 called Race Horse in Training. You could probably find it too. And it <laughs> referred to this rule and said, fortunately, it was stopped, I'm quoting it, it was stopped in its infancy thanks to the vigilance of the jockey club, right? The system we use to vote is named for something they used to do in horse racing that the jockey club got rid of in 1880. Just, just say it. It must be a wonderful system. Now, all of these horses and all of these riders, where were they all riding around? Not in Canada. All of this terminology and all of this system came from rural Britannia 
Britannia ruled the waves. The great British Empire developed the system of voting that we have, and only those countries that were ever part of the British Empire used this system. That's something else the Canadians don't really know about our system of voting, first past the post. Most modern democracies don't use it. They don't go near it. There are many reasons why not, and I'll get into some of those, but it's a, it's a hand-me-down. Now, in 1867, which we all know because it is now, yay, 150th birthday of Canada, recognizing that there were other people here first, so I just like to remind us of that when we celebrate the 150th birthday. But our Constitution, the British North America Act, 1867, said Canada's Parliament shall be elected using the system we're using now at Westminster until such time as the Canadian Parliament decides on its own system. 150 years and counting, we are essentially still wearing Queen Victoria's old hand-me-downs. We have not improved on it, and it's not as though parliaments haven't tried. I was, again, something I learned from being on the Special Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform. The first time the Canadian Parliament studied our voting system was in 1921. And they concluded that in any democracy with more than two parties, which Canada had three, four, five parties since the early part of the 20th century, that in any system with more than two parties, first past the post, did not work. It was a bad system for Canada. But we didn't take it forward to figure out what would be a good system. Well, let me take you to the second problem, the problem of the wrong winner. Now, it's been on our minds a lot lately. I know you're all thinking of it. <laughs> and best picture goes to La La Land. <laughs> oh my God, the consternation. You saw it, the cast and crew of La La Land are on stage giving their thank yous. And then there's people with headsets and they're running around behind. It's like, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. They're not the real winner. Don't you just wish that when Donald Trump put his hand on the Bible, <laughs> someone hadn't just run up and said, sorry, mistake. <laughs> While we were tweeting, we missed that Hillary Clinton got three million more votes than you. I'm so sorry, Mr. Trump. Wrong winner. Now, the wrong winner problem, amazingly enough, yes, the United States of America threw off the British Empire, had a whole revolution about it, got rid of King George III, but what the heck? They kept first past the post. And they made it even weirder by creating the Electoral College. So some of you, and I think a lot of Canadians often think as we look at other countries, we can feel a bit smug. We can say to ourselves, well, that couldn't happen here. Not only could it happen here, it has happened here. The wrong winner problem happens because under first past the post, the way we vote separates the seat count from the popular vote. So in 1957, John Diefenbaker, by popular vote, lost the election that he won. The Liberals under Louis Saint-Laurent had more votes than John Diefenbaker, but, and literally we could say in the rest is history, Diefenbaker became Prime Minister. In 1979, the Progressive Conservatives under Joe Clark had fewer votes than the Liberals under Pierre Trudeau. But it was one of those wrong winner problems and the Liberals lost the election even though they won the popular vote. The, the wrong winner problem is really quite confusing. It's happened a lot. It's happened in the UK. And if you wonder why it is that New Zealand, a Commonwealth country with a constitutional monarchy, just like us, Her Majesty is their head of state, and a, a Westminster system of electing members of parliament, if you wonder why New Zealand has proportional representation, fair voting under the system they picked, mixed member proportional, Probably because in the late 70s and early 80s, 
They got two wrong winter elections in a row. Two times in a row, the people of New Zealand voted for a party and gave more votes to the party that lost. It can happen here. It has happened here. We really need to be concerned about having a system that can deliver to us a government with the wrong winner. And even, uh, in some ways, an almost bigger problem is the problem of the wrong big winner. When a minority of the voters vote for a party that manages to accumulate the majority of the seats, and that's when you have a majority government that doesn't have the support of the majority of voters. It's easy to see how it happens. If you're going riding by riding, a lot of those votes disappear. Now, I'll give you an example. In, in 2015, one, there's a, a group of MPs who were elected in their own ridings with less than 29% of the popular vote. 28.6, 28.8. They were competitive. I'm not saying we are all equal as part members of parliament. It doesn't matter how much we carried our own riding by. We're equals. But when you're in Quebec with a strong campaign for Bloc, a strong campaign for Liberals, a strong campaign for Greens, well, you can see how it happens. You can win your seat leaving 72% of the voters in your riding with their votes not counting. That's how you accumulate this big distance between the seat count and the popular vote. So point three, you're designing a voting system, you ought to design it to work for the voters and not for political parties. Now political parties want one thing, and I think you know what it is, they want power. And they will manipulate any voting system you give them to figure out how to play the odds to get that power. So under first past the post, since it's the seat count that matters and not the popular vote, increasingly in recent years, the big parties know you don't need to go forward to the Canadian public and try to get the majority to agree with you. And you don't need to necessarily listen to the majority of Canadians when they tell you what they want you to do. Because you're playing the odds and you're slicing and dicing a targeted message. You're using dog whistle politics. You're using voter suppression. Political parties and the big ones like first past the post because they've got this sense that even if they lose one election or two elections, eventually it'll be their turn again, right? People talk about politics in Canada all the time, that the phenomenon isn't about people getting excited and voting for what they want. It's about this overwhelming incentive to throw the bums out. And then you get a big sweep in the other direction and everything the last government does, the new government tries to change. That's what parties like. What do voters like? Voters like knowing that when you put your little X next to a name on the ballot, your vote has clout. You want to know that your vote means something. And when you vote for a person in your riding to be your MP or a party whose beliefs you align with your own and that person represents that, you want to know that your vote is going to count. And if you live in a riding and you know the stories, you know, you could run a goat with a red sweater and he'd win in this riding because the liberals always win, or you could run a dog in a blue sweater. If you're living in a place like that where the outcome seems certain before you go to the polls, you have less reason to go. Voters want to know that their vote's going to count and have clout. Second thing voters really want in a democracy should be absolutely obvious that every system should let people vote for what they want. Vote for what you believe in. Vote to send a message. Vote to use your voice. But in first past the post, so often people say, well, I know what I want. I want to vote for that party X. But if I vote for party X, I'm terribly afraid party Y might get in. So I'm going to have to hold my nose and vote for party Z. Now, I don't know about you, but I think when you can't breathe as you vote, it's actually not very healthy. I think it induces nausea, makes it less likely you're going to vote again next time. So voting for what you want should be something we build into a voting system as something that's meaningful. You have your vote has clout. You know you can vote for what you want without getting what you most fear. The third thing that Canadians really want in a voting system is knowing that the way the collectivity of Canadians have voted is reflected in the seat count in the House of Commons. You want to know that the popular vote 
is reflected in the parliament you get. It's a democracy. That should be considered so basic that we shouldn't still be talking about it. So don't you think, in the 150th birthday, since we were first told, as soon as Parliament can get around to it, you can pick a voting system that works for Canada, we ought to have a look at the voting systems that could work for Canada, that we should look at the systems that allow us to keep an MP representing us locally. So just so you know, our committee said ixnay on anything like the system used in Israel where you just vote for political party. We do want to have, I love that I represent a constituency, people who tell me what they want and I work for them. And my constituents want to know who is their MP, who's their go-to person for everything. Now, that can be protected with mixed number proportional like they use in Germany and New Zealand, with single transferable vote, clustering the ridings and being able to pick a number of of candidates every time you go to vote, electing a number of MPs for a clustered riding. These systems can be tweaked. They will work great for Canada. What we do know is that first past the post is a system that doesn't work well for anyone. So in 2017, for our 150th birthday party, what do you say? Shouldn't we have rules that are at least as fair as what the jockey club insisted on in 1880? <laughs> And shouldn't we have elections? <laughs> and shouldn't we have elections that are even fairer than the Oscars? <laughs> the envelope, please. Thank you.